Hello and welcome to Spectrum Analysis, once again. A show where I, an artist with a film degree and far too much time on his hands, rambles about his hyperfixations for way too long. On the poker table today is Lackadaisy, the webcomic and the animated pilot. Now, I'm not going to go over the whole webcomic, and even though I know many of you out there are built like me, and are willing to watch a five-hour video essay on the many flaws of Chibnall Who six times, I will also like to maybe have some free time in the future, and also open this up to a slightly wider audience. As such, this episode will be structured differently than my other episodes, as I won't go into the plot of the comic too much, but I will give a very detailed rundown of the integral characters. Unlike my first has-been video, I will be adding time codes in the description of this analysis, and every analysis from now on, giving the viewer the ability to jump up, jump around, and get down to whatever section they want. I would wager that many of the people who watched the pilot weren't well acquainted with the comic at all, and as such, if you do want to skip past the comic segment, and, you know, the character segment and all that, just to hear my analysis of the pilot, like many initial reactors went into it, that's fine. Just know I will be referring back to the character section, as many little lore moments and animation details are relevant to the wider characters as we see them in the comic. I will also be covering the little animated shorts too, but not the ones that are dubs of existing comics. I'll probably not mention the little side comics you can see in the gallery section of the Lackadaisy website either, as they're rarely plot relevant and more some little comedic jabs a lot of the time. There will be some exceptions, so with the caveat that you should be reading the comic, and you should be reading the comic, please god read the comic. We all good? Supple. Avante. Preamble. Lagadaisy is a webcomic that began in 2006 from the mad mind of one Tracy J. Butler. She decided one day to make a comic using her own pet cats as inspiration for the characters, and her favourite historical era, Prohibition, as the setting. Initially beginning as just some side comic and concept sketches, Lackadaisy eventually became a full-blown story that's been going on since about 2006 or 2008. The dates confuse me. As you can imagine, this means that she's had a good 18 years to improve her craft, and boy has she! The art style of the comic has changed many times, and in the beginning even the characters shifted personality, which actually reflected in their design. Four years ago now, the comic halted as Tracy, as well as many associates, got to work crowdfunding an animated short film based on the comic, which would act as a sort of pilot for a potential series in the future. So far there hasn't been the interest that has been saw, in other words, being bought out by a company, and production, as far as I can tell, has not begun on an indie series as of yet. So the comic hasn't continued either, besides the side comics I mentioned, which is a little infuriating, since they left us on a terribly exciting cliffhanger for three years. Four years now. Half-Life 2, Episode 2 has competition. Anyway, in my very uninformed opinion, based on my admittedly unfinished opinion on the last two has-been episodes released, I have just a touch more faith in Tracy and the gang to produce a narratively satisfying series. I think Viv and her team excels in character design and interplay, but falls just short in pacing and plot, whereas Tracy seems to have the direction of the show figured out already, and plugs the gap with well-written character interplay. Controversial opinion, perhaps, but my reviews of episode 5 and 6 of Has Been have explained this stance of mine. The beginning of this comic hiatus is when I jumped on the fan train. As a has-been fan, I was avidly watching Ashley Nichols' Honeycast streams, one of which involved Tracy and her team. This was right as the crowdfunding for the pilot began. This series of streams also introduced me to B-Stars and many other stunning voice actors that I still love to this day. You should really watch the Honeycast if you can, or just get into Ashley Nichols' work in general. She's doing her own animated uh, pilot, I think, sometime soon. Not to mention, the music from that is pretty amazing. Ah! 
beat my own head in with a rock because I couldn't stand the fact that I'll never get to fuck. But um, as you can see from these real life <laughs> items in my room, Lackadaisy has been part of my life for a while. My little Mordecai plushie just sitting over on the shelf there, full of OCD, and my uh, Lackadaisy shot glasses, which I have been using frequently for liquor that is probably just as painful as the ones they would have drunk in the pilot. Anyway, what is this comic about? Well, let's get into the spirit of things. Where's my sepia filter? St. Louis, 1920, located at the junction of the Mississippi and Missouri Rivers. The city is one of the nation's largest. It's both a busy river port and a major train hub. The recent enactment of national prohibition promises to bring great change, for better or for worse. The city's once prosperous breweries struggle to remain in business. Most do not survive. But an emerging underground industry begins filling the gaps, or the taps, as it were. Meanwhile, restaurateur Atlas May owns and operates a modest niche within the city, the Little Daisy Cafe. But his unassuming establishment happens also to be a portal into the extensive maze of limestone caves below St. Louis. And by all accounts, Atlas is an opportunist. Soon, though St. Louis is dry on the surface, there's a wellspring underground. A club-shaped pin worn under the collar or inside the lapel grants trusted patrons access to this subterranean place. The Lackadaisy Speakeasy. The location of St. Louis in the middle of the country means illegal liquor flows in by numerous routes. Never at a loss for supply, Lackadaisy prospers and becomes the city's most prominent bootleg operation. Atlas has a small empire. But as prohibition persists, formidable rivals begin to emerge. The competition is anything but friendly. Enemies lurk around every corner. And in 1926, Atlas meets a violent end. Lackadaisy falls into the hands of his widow, Mitzi May. But there are rumors of her involvement in his death. Amidst shaken loyalties and mounting pressure from competitors, there's a great exodus of constituents. A near-fatal blow for the Lackadaisy itself. By 1927, only a small faction of Atlas's crew and a handful of steadfast patrons remain. The organization struggles to survive. And so, while the rest of the city and much of the world celebrate the spirit of St. Louis, certain other individuals are preoccupied with the spirits in St. Louis. The comic takes place in 1927, during the height of Prohibition. I mentioned this briefly in my has-been review, but I realise that even some of the Yangs among you don't all know about Prohibition, so let me take you on a history trip. Throughout the late 1800s in the US, several groups, mainly Christian women's groups, rallied against many moral failings in society, having to deal with their abusive husbands, having no vote or autonomy, and lacking agency in their lives. One of the moral issues brought up a lot was alcohol, as people back then drank, like, 50 times what we do now. Many other groups jumped on this bandwagon, drowning out the concerns of women, as they are wont to do, mainly pushed by one crazy man named Wayne Wheeler, and eventually the anti-German sentiment fostered by the Great War, since many brewers were German, as well as the fact that there was a grain shortage during the war. These parties got the government to pass an amendment to ban the sale of alcohol to anyone, this was the Volstead Act, and became a constitutional amendment shortly after it was introduced. Despite the draconian law, exceptions were found, like alcohol could still be used for religious and medical purposes. Quickly, though, people turned from skirting the law by going to their doctor for their whiskey prescription, to outright breaking the law by just making underground bars. Cops were unlikely to prosecute their neighbour for having a little tipple, and in many cases, the people making, selling, and transporting illegal booze paid these coppers off. In this heady air of illegality, organised crime flourished, and societal norms were shirked. One icon of this cultural milieu was the Speakeasy, a hidden club or bar that operated as a legitimate front by day and held raucous parties by night, where anyone could come and lose themselves for a while. As you ban something, though, you lose important restrictions. 
if booze is illegal, then you can't have things like minimum drinking age, rules about what to put in the booze, standard last call times, and as such, people of all ages will be drinking all night, just chugging down booze, probably cut with coffin varnish and turpentine. As such, many other things flaunted in this time were things like race, gender, sexuality. You went to a speakeasy to drink illegal moonshine and no one would look at you funny for flirting with a black girl. Or even a guy. These are the cultural shake-ups I mentioned in my Hasbin review, when theorising about Angel Dust's past. Now every single person in the country, practically, is a criminal, and those trying to catch these criminals are overwhelmed or being paid not to. And the economy is tanking as prohibition officers are expensive, and the alcohol industry makes up a lot of jobs that have just been thrown away, and also, at the time, it impacted a large population of immigrant workers. Eventually, after the Second World War and the Great Depression, having a new booming industry sounded like a great idea, and they repealed the amendment. They can repeal amendments, America, remember that. Organised crime slowly turned to things like hard drugs to fill this niche, and again, things overall got a little bit better for a while, as they tend to. Now, our story takes place right at the height of this, and with the Great Depression right round the corner, many people are struggling. This includes some of the previous moguls of illicit industry, like the lackadaisy speakeasy. Situated in a limestone cave under St. Louis, or St. Louis, St. Blah, and more specifically below the adorable Little Daisy Cafe, this secret bar used to be the hopping place to be before its proprietor, Atlas May, was killed by his competitors the year before. At least, seemingly. We'll get to that. The one now running the business is Mitzi May, his grieving, if shady, widow. And she's not doing a great job. This is mostly due to bad luck, admittedly. Among her motley crew of criminals, we have many fun characters. So let's get into them. Characters. Mitzi May, widow and shady business proprietor. An ostensible southern belle with a refined air that's a total put-on. She's gutter trash from the streets that managed to marry a wealthy gangster and now acts like a baroness to hide her humble roots. She began her journey in life as a travelling musician and dancer with a band that still plays at the Lackadaisy today. Due to her rough upbringing, she has a hearty tolerance for liquor and can likely drink you under the table without getting tipsy. She doesn't seem to have the ruthless streak necessary for this kind of business, but considering there's theories in-universe and out that she's the one who organised the hit on her husband, that may not be so accurate. Victor Vasco, the grumpy grandfather of the group. Victor began life in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in modern-day Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia, before being conscripted into the Great War. He eventually went AWOL and began fighting with the Triple Entente powers, eventually being sent back to the US once his tour of duty was done, and his home was being reorganised into the not-so-Austro-or-Hungarian-anymore empire. Once in the US, he had no roots and no future, and being a penniless immigrant, got to work at the docks, where his presence even near a communist meeting got him arrested. He took down several officers before finally being subdued. This surly Slovene was finally picked up by Atlas, after losing his eye in the scuffle, and being bailed out. He became a powerful and feared hatchet man for the business, before he was literally kneecapped by another one of Lackadaisy's hatchet men. Although not a literal hatchet man, we'll get to that. Now Victor tends bar at the speakeasy, since he can't really do his usual job. He's fiercely loyal to the Lackadaisy, and especially to Alice's goddaughter. Ivy Pepper, Alice's goddaughter, and the youngest member of the crew. She's an excitable and new-age girl into crazy things like wearing trousers and learning to shoot. She has a habit of latching on to young men and then losing them quickly either to her own idiosyncrasies or to the threat of physical violence from her guardian, Victor. She has a silver tongue despite her propensity to forget to use it, and is well known for her powers of manipulation and dashing looks. Rourke Rocky Rickaby a young lad of Irish stock, Rocky is a problem incarnate. Frequently, people would try to ascribe mental issues to the cast of Lackadaisy, but Tracy discourages this, as it makes more sense to her for the characters to just exist without labels. Despite this, it's clear that something is up with Rocky. He has a hard time focusing, is clumsy and easily spooked, and is known for his love of poetry, music, and his winning smile. His smile rarely fades, and he faces every problem in the same way 
with unintentional chaos, and occasionally intentional chaos. He has a habit of going completely off when handed a situation in which to cause chaos, and it's the one thing he knows how to do without fail, most of the time. When your track record is screwing everything up, you embrace every screw up as an art form, especially with fire. Rocky travelled the country after his parents died, and eventually found a job in his hometown as the violinist for the Lackadaisy Band. Rocky has a deep and profound care for Mitzi, treating her almost like a mother, and has a sharp-toothed grin and a devilish prank for anyone who may come between him and her. Calvin Freckle McMurray Rocky's reserved cousin, Freckle stuck around St. Louis while his cousin went off on his adventures. During this time, he applied to be a police officer, but things didn't quite go his way. Feeling aimless, and at the prodding of his cousin, Freckle joined the gang and ended up as the newest infatuation of Ivy's. Why would Rocky invite this shy and closed-off little good boy and registered bean to be a criminal? Well, Freckle has too much of his cousin's blood in him, and at any time he is handed a weapon, something snaps within him, turning him into a giggling madman, a condition he is frequently very upset about. As such, he's the recently acquired muscle for the group, since nobody would dare give Rocky a gun. The only thing Freckle is more scared of than the wrath of God is the wrath of his religious Irish mother and Rocky's aunt, Nina. Sedgwick Wick Sable, owner and proprietor of the Sable Mining Company, this is a man with a distinct fascination with rocks and quarrying. The first time he entered the Lackadaisy, he lost his mind as it's situated in a large limestone cave. As such, it's become a favourite haunt of the rich quarrymen. Mitzi frequently has romantic interactions with him, mostly as a means to get him to fund the speakeasy, and frequently unsuccessfully. Rocky has a deep loathing for Wick as a result of his connection with Mitzi, and will frequently play pranks on him. He has a deeply seated addiction for alcohol and coffee, and an even deeper fear of ducks. Mordecai Heller, a brutal and efficient hatchet man that gave Victor his bum leg. Mordecai comes from a Jewish family in New York, but one too many bad choices led him onto a train car cornered by many enemies. On that same train just so happened to be Atlas May, who left him a gun to fight his way out with. Ever since that day, Mordecai has been fiercely loyal to Atlas and Mitzi, as loyalty is the only emotion he can feel besides disgust and frustration anymore. It's theorised that he was the one to pull the trigger on Atlas at Mitzi's command, but why is still a mystery. After Atlas's death, he kneecapped Victor and left the speakeasy to work at a competing one called Marigold, while still visiting Mitzi from time to time, of course. A severely obsessive man, with a fixation on symmetry, punctuality, and looking pristine at all times, he knows a sharp suit cuts just as deeply as a sharpened hatchet. Seraphine and Nicodem Savoy. I'm doing these together because they wouldn't like to be split up. I don't know how to pronounce their last name either. They're Creole Cajun and speak an odd francophone dialect that implies it could be Savoy or Savoir. Seraphine and Nicodem were born in the bayous of New Orleans. New Orleans, if you're from anywhere but America, where they were to be split up at an early age. Not wanting to be separated, of course, they fled into the swamps and followed what they thought was a spirit guide to a voodoo witch's hut. There, Sarah learned voodoo rituals, and Nico learned to be a bit of a pugilist. Sarah and Nico eventually worked odd jobs, with Nico eventually becoming a well-known boxer, until eventually becoming criminals. They quickly found out that ripping off booze convoys got them more money than Nico's boxing. Eventually, the competing speakeasy that Mordecai joined, Marigold, got fed up of their shipments being hijacked by these two, and instead of dealing with them in the old-fashioned way, they saw their potential, and they hired them. Now they work closely with Mordecai, much to his chagrin, and have become a brutal and terrifying force to be put against. Now we come to the side characters. Dorian Zib Zibowski. Born in Wisconsin, though with some potentially non-American heritage, Zib was burnt out and brain-dead from the moment he was born. The saxophone player for the Lackadaisy Band, and potentially Mitzi's former paramour, Zib lives like the philosophers of old. By that I mean he's a spaced-out loser who thinks too much and too little. For Zib, consciousness is a continuum, not a binary, and he can fall asleep anywhere. Is he even awake? Who knows? Asa Sweet, the owner of the Marigold Speakeasy. 
Things are going great for Sweet. His competition is failing, and he's got himself three new ruthless enforcers to do his dirty work for him. While cordial and polite with Mitzi, he'd rather see her buried than fade into obscurity. The Arbogasts Elsa was a burnt-out American nurse during the Great War, where she met the verbose and energetic former soldier, Bobby, a man from Britain. They fell in love and got married before moving back home to run an undertaking business with Elsa's religious and overzealous brother, Abelard. Aside from the corpse rearing, though, coffin varnish is a great additive for illegal booze. And, as we see in Some Like It Hot, a coffin is a great way to smuggle bottles. Likely, this whole setup was inspired by that movie. These three used to provide liquor for the Lackadaisy before their fall from grace, and now they smuggle it for the Marigold. In the comic, though, they begin double dealing and begin supplying Lackadaisy once again. Then we get into the really incidental characters, the ones that have little to no presence in the pilot, and only little presence in the comic so far. Lacey Hart, Wick's put-upon and overworked secretary. She's the only thing keeping Wick bound to the mortal plane, as without her he would ascend through caffeine and paperwork. We don't really see her much in the comics, or at all in the pilot. Dominic Drago. Drago? I don't know. We don't see this guy in the pilot either, and we only see a little bit of him in the comic. He's the newest Prohibition agent in town, tasked with taking down the illegal speakeasies in the area. He seems like he'd be a big threat in the comic, but only appears once so far. Although, judging from the cliffhanger we were left on, for four years, he's likely to be more involved in the future. Suave, intelligent, and debonair, always smoking a pipe, and seemingly the only cop who cares about the Volstead Act. The rest of the characters are even smaller parts, but they're all fun. For example, there's Miss Babka, the myopic and somewhat confused little Slovak woman who is one of Victor's only friends. It's rare to hear your home tongue in America, one imagines. There's the pig farmers, who are minor antagonists in the beginning of the comic, and one of them has the same name as one of my exes. Ew. There's Dr. Quackenbrush, who provides medical care to horses and sometimes ailing mobsters for the right price. The rest are such minor roles, they're not really worth talking about here. So, with all of that out of the way, we can get into the animated content. I mentioned I'll talk about the animated shorts here too, but since there's only two out right now, and a third one that's coming by the time I'm probably finished recording this segment, it's probably worth talking about them only briefly. I'm also not going to talk about any comic dubs. These shorts were also released after the pilot, so let's get into the pilot first. Plot. The pilot opens on a stage, implying we're being given a show. This presentation is, if I remember correctly, how they frame this pilot's canonicity. It can be canon, or just one of the many stories of the infamous Lackadaisy. Either something in-universe but separate, or canon but embellished, and open to retcon in the future. Kind of like Twin Snakes. The whole play motif also fits heavily into our main character, Rocky. His love of music and poetry and theatrics really ties in here as he opens the pilot with a violin run that's designed to grab your attention. Old Man River. This poem is ripped straight from the comic which is always a good choice when trying to convince an audience that you've nailed the source material. Show them how good you can follow the material's coattails before you start straying, so they trust you to make changes. Like even down to the poem ending in Encore? Encore? Uh, no encore? No, no, that's plenty. We're fine. Once Rocky's poem comes to an end, Ivy reminds him of their existence. Freckle is digging up a coffin and Ivy is holding the light for him. Rocky is supposed to be the surreptitious lookout on high, but seems to forget the concept of secrecy, as usual. In an effort to excuse his abundance of energy by claiming they need the right ambience for their work, he drops his hat and falls off the bridge whilst trying to catch it. Gotta love the violin noises as he falls here. Unless you're a violinist, in which case this is just a trigger warning for you. I provide the up! Oh! The comedic timing here is great. 
and remains solid for the whole pilot. Rocky continues as if nothing happened, of course, still explaining his use of the violin on a secret mission, while Ivy derides him and says that he's still useful as a rag to wipe their hands on. Here, Freckle hits pay dirt, and Rocky throws himself onto the coffin to take a look. Here we get one of my favourite recurring jokes of the pilot, Freckle's constant battle with Rocky's tail. When the concern is raised that they got the wrong grave, Rocky pulls out a newspaper clipping of an obituary that shows off a bit more of the humour of the show. Hat from Schviel. Under the Truss of Peace, Saturday, September 12th, 1927. Hermann Hapf from Schviel was struck by a runaway circus calliope near the terminus of Biddle Street, whereupon, in a cacophony of frenzied glee, he was flung bodily into the Mississippi River. Requiring the painstaking effort of the Number 26 Firehouse Brigade, his remains were later disentangled from the paddle wheel spokes of the SS Albatross, having been rearranged into an impressive Merovingian knot. He died doing what he loved, remarked his stoical widow, by whom he is survived, alongside a niece, a nephew, and several southern cousins. A shoe-wearing donkey named Pibbles, and a prize collection of 64 fashionable soup bowls housed at I have to say bowls because I have to I have no idea what else it is housed at his West End residence services are to be held Monday next at the East City chapel I love this show not only is this hilarious but it's a surprisingly genius method of revealing the dead drop locations no pun intended dead drop huh. for the booze that the hour guests are delivering also, this clipping was part of a fun little ARG the Lackadaisy website was doing for a while. I honestly can't remember what it did, though. They begin to lug the coffin to their car, and Freckle's jumpy nature comes out here. He's not only religious and hates desecrating a grave, but also superstitious and feels like he's disturbed the other spirits here. This scene is full of alcohol puns about spirits and spirits. Get it? Rocky yells at the ghosts, and Freckle wishes their shared overbearing religious trauma was here to stop them from doing something stupid. Rocky misses the implication and needs it cleared up. I wish my mum was here. What? Blasphemy! That force of nature, she'd stop us dead. I know. Right as this happens, a train blasts by on the bridge that Rocky was playing around on, and there's this fun little detail of their cat-like nature shining through their anthropomorphized designs when their fur stands on end when they're startled. Rocky then says, <laughs> Gora! Oh, for a moment there I thought it was your mom. Which I take both as, your mother is terrifying, and your mother is as big as a train. Both hilarious. Basically, it's a 1920s your mom joke. They get back to the car and only now open the coffin to check that they haven't desecrated a grave. Surely Ivy could have brought a crowbar. She's only holding a flashlight. Rocky could have held a crowbar if it weren't for these... these... spaghetti arms! Luckily, they grab the right coffin, and it's packed to the brim with Canadian whiskey, likely cut with adulterants. Rocky begins packing the booze while humming whiskey in the jar. I think we should hurry. If you got deep into that shanty craze a few years back, you may know this song. Or if you're a Metallica fan like me. He also sings this in the comic. Rocky then tells Ivy to get the car started, but to keep the lights off. Adding onto the comment about keeping the lights off to make sure they're unseen, Rocky drops a bottle of booze and asks her to shine the light so that he can see it. Here we get more liquor puns. Moderation. Where's that spotlight when we need it, Miss Pepper? Well, now the spirits are afoot. Oh, I got it. No, I that got it. is my foot. That's not what I meant. No, I... Ivy struggles with the light for a moment before a bright beam illuminates the graveyard. But it's not from Ivy. There's this wonderful moment of tension here as the cinematic bars push in. The lights are from the Marigold's crew, who arrived in their own four-door with an arsenal of firearms, and more worryingly, Seraphine wielding one. One thing I forgot to mention in my character sum-up is just how crazy the twins are. 
Seraphine is the more calm, calculating type, while Nico is still canny and marked by his wits and suave swagger, but he's a touch more unhinged at times. and less into guns than his own fists. Seraphine is known to use a customised Browning Automatic Rifle, or BAR, with a sawn-off barrel and an alligator engraved into the grip. She unleashes hell upon the crew. Ivy backs up to avoid the fire, and this draws the attention away from Rocky and Freckle just long enough for Rocky to grab the lost bottle and for them to begin their escape. Ivy spins round and catches up to them, luckily far enough away for Sarah's bar to become inaccurate and whiff more shots. Although, this may be intentional, as Sarah is using a known tactic called marching fire or walking fire, where you blast bullets while approaching an enemy without aiming in order to pin them down. This was a tactic developed during the First World War, specifically for use with handheld automatic weapons like the BAR. Nice touch! The Marigold Gang gives chase, and Mordecai chastises Seraphine for taking her time to sort this out. Mordecai, of course, would have had this done in a heartbeat, and his efficiency clashes with the thrill of the chase mentality that the twins share. Nico tells them that this way is much more fun, and Sarah quashes the idea of this being a trifling matter, as Mordecai says. Hmm, can't let the competition go unchecked. Even a little vermin. They got a way of... festering. This and all their interactions tells us a lot about their varying approaches. Mordecai would have taken them all out at once, quickly and quietly, so he could get the rest of his jobs done that night. He'd rather leave these small fry for later and get his more important work done. Sarah and Nico love to watch their prey squirm as they run, and they also know that the smallest crack in the foundations can bring down their empire. They use specific tactics to make sure that they can keep the lackadaisy crew sweating for longer. Mordecai is pure efficiency and logic, as he sees no tactical advantage in chasing these little nuisances for so long. Seraphine, especially, is more streetwise than him, knowing that the slightest release of pressure on the boot can make the neck that's under it wriggle free and grab the nearest sharp object. She wants to deal with every slight threat with as much brutality as possible, and have some fun while doing it. Ivy shows off her driving proficiency here, or lack thereof, while Rocky comments that she's so bad at driving that she temporarily confused the enemy, making this out to be a good thing. They're not confused for long, though, and the chase ensues. Here we see the more odd combination of 3D and 2D artwork that this show decides to use. It reminds me very heavily of the latter 2D animated Disney movies like Tarzan and Treasure Planet, using their deep canvas tech to animate 2D characters over 3D environments. This is a cool touch, and while it takes a second to get used to, and can somewhat draw your eye and pull you out of the experience, it almost leans into the stage play angle that the show is going for, adding the suspension of disbelief angle that most plays tend to have, as we see painted backdrops and the props as separate from our characters, but we put that knowledge to the side. On top of this stylistic choice, you may have noticed the sketch lines and guides still being visible in the finished work. This is also something that takes a second to get used to, but it's a purposeful stylistic choice by the animators, so I've heard. We see less of this in the shorts, but it's still noticeable. Rocky then pulls Freckle aside to tell him that it's his time to perform, handing him his instrument. Freckle already begins his trademark freakout as he's handed a Thompson submachine gun. The little kettle whistle here is a nice touch. <laughs> Rocky calls him Torpedo Boy in this scene, which isn't a reference to the comic, but it reminds me of Danny Whizbang from the Peaky Blinders show. So named because the Whizbangs or artillery shells of the Great War gave him PTSD and made him unpredictable. While Freckle didn't fight in the war, his mental unpredictability is implied by this nickname, especially since torpedoes stay hidden in plain sight until they unexpectedly explode. The marigolds blow out the back window and ram the car, knocking Rocky onto the trunk and the back. <laughs> the trunk. Wait, is that where this is that where that word comes from? He tries desperately to stop the bottles from bleeding out, and Nico threateningly begins accelerating towards him, making his intentions to make Rocky into one of his beloved pancakes. 
very clear. As the tension builds, unseen inside the car, Freckles' mental switch has flipped, and he's been assembling a beautiful machine. He grabs his Chicago typewriter and begins to make a masterpiece. It's so fun to see one of his freakouts animated. After reading the comics, this was a massive fanboy moment. Rocky's smile here is fun as well. He seems to enjoy Freckles' craziness in the comics. The music here is also phenomenal. Electro swing mixed with dubstep? Hell yeah! <laughs> As Freckles' outburst creates a moment to breathe, Rocky ties down the trunk with his lucky tie and climbs back into the flivver. The Marigolds drop back for a second, with Sarah and Nico giggling like idiots about their close brush with death. Seraphine and Nicodem's interplay here is so fun, Nico being more concerned about swallowing a bug than being shot, and Sarah being annoyed at Nico for just getting a tasty snack, the bug, when she didn't. Nico then spits it out, only to laugh about the fact that it's BROKEN GLASS! Mordecai again ruins their fun by criticising them for not being able to keep up with the lackadaisy crew. Nico comments that they weren't exactly expecting him to whip out a Tommy gun, and he suggests that maybe Mordecai drives. He refuses, especially with the front window broken, and gone down Nico's throat. Presumably he doesn't want to get bugs on his nice suit. Sarah mocks him for barely doing anything this whole time, and then pushes just the right button. Oh, you don't like how we play? How about you stop spectating and throw in, Chef? Or do we have to worry about you getting sentimental about old times? She comments that he may still have an emotional attachment to the lackadaisy crew, and this gets Mordecai to pull out his mirror shine 1911 pistol. Sarah really comes off as a cerebral enemy sometimes, as well as a psycho ball of chaos. She's really the most dangerous kind of antagonist. In the comics, she's one of the only people to make Mordecai bleed. Back in the Lackadaisy Gang's car, Freckle is still blasting like Danny DeVito, and Rocky is doing his best to direct both Ivy's driving and Freckle's wall of fire. Rocky shows a surprising tactical skill here by telling Ivy to break. This makes Nico swerve into the grass, and he pulls Freckle around just in time to blast out their tyres. Just as he's about to unload into the gang's car, however, he runs dry, and Freckle's disdain is obvious. As they come to a harsh stop, Mordecai gets out and calmly aligns himself with the very centre of the road. Rocky frantically tells Ivy to pull a left, and catches a glimpse of Mordecai behind him. Unlike the others in the car, Rocky has a decent idea of how dangerous Mordecai is, and grabs the wheel from Ivy, wrenching them round just in time to dodge Mordecai's perfectly aimed shot. The ticking that comes in just as Mordecai locks in is wonderful, underlining his efficiency and his obsession with precision. Use your imagination, Miss Pepper! Rocky, I can't steer! This and a later scene shows off everything about his personality quite well, and I'll talk more about this then. The car begins barreling towards one of Wick's quarries, and Rocky makes the amazingly petty move to spend time and effort in swerving just a little to the left to destroy the sign instead of going through the open gate. One of his many moves in his perpetual spat against Wick. They crash into a maintenance shed, and Rocky gracefully exits the vehicle. His brush with death has activated his inner orange cat genes, and chaos awakens within him. Use these smear frames for whatever purposes you see fit. Ivy seems to know what's coming upon hearing Rocky's laugh, commenting that it's playtime, and she turns to check on Freckle. He's... Oh, is it playtime now? Do you think we're safe? <laughs> Freckle is scary in the right context. Sorry. 
He's an absolute baby face, but even when he's drawn like an adorable bean, he can be in this manic state to a degree. This scene from the comic shows this, and I didn't even realize this until I saw it on Reddit the other day. His immediate determination to kill these two opposing gang members after learning from Rocky that this is why he's been brought onto the job is just a little unsettling. Freckle, upon seeing Ivy, calms down and tries to explain himself. Ivy hasn't seen this element of him yet, even in the comics, and she tends to think that he's just along for her amusement most of the time. This may be a little bit of a wake-up call for her if it ends up being canon. Freckle, as seen in the crowbar scene and several moments in the comic, actually does like her back, and this is why he calms down so quickly, and has to explain his fiery nature so frantically. The double meaning of a burning hot fire inside him, right as he locks eyes with her, also betrays this feeling, although he covers it nicely by changing in him to in the engine compartment, as the vehicle nearly bursts into flames from the malfunctioning radiator. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to. It's just that there's a, a fire, a burning hot fire in, uh, in, the, in the engine compartment. <laughs> this makes this a triple entendre, as the fire represents his rage, his love, and the imminent fear of death in this moment. It's hilarious. Ivy dashes out of the car and does her best despite not being a mechanic. She chucks radiator fluid onto the burning hot engine and then tries to dissipate the heat by suffocating it with her torn off sleeve, burning herself in the process. As the repairs continue, the marigolds stalk purposefully into the quarry, weapons drawn. Rocky's being his usual chaotic self, and it's worth noting that in the comic, he becomes even more chaotic after a severe head injury. It's possible the crash has a similar effect here. He twitches around the yard looking for anything fun to play with, and he decides to turn on all the power in the facility. Seeing this, the opposing crew ready themselves for an ambush, with Mordecai checking his pistol is loaded, and Nico and Sarah sharing a knowing smirk as they realise the fun is about to begin. Here, Rocky marvels in the carnival-like beauty of the lights in the quarry, before finding the main attraction, or what I guess is the mine attraction, <laughs> The excavator will prove useful in defending everyone if he can just find his ticket to ride. Suddenly, the explosives shed catches his eye, and the funfair opens for business. Well, I'm nearly out of sleeves and ideas. Ivy is slowly running out of options and sleeves and Freckle is wary about the approaching chuckles of the Savoys. He remembers Ivy mentioning a spare pistol in the car somewhere, but upon finding it, they realise it's barely more than a fly swatter. Freckle decides to draw them off long enough for Ivy to get the car working, but even amidst the terror and fear of death, Calvin remembers his manners. I'll draw them away. You start the car. Please. After several oddly muddy frames, we finally realise that Nico is armed with some kind of revolver, I don't know why the former scenes made this weapon so blurry, but oh well. Mordecai again criticises the Savoy's tactics, saying scaring them will only scatter them, making it harder to get them. Herding cats is notoriously difficult. Seraphine and Nico really despise Mordecai's aversion to enjoying his job. This face says it all. Freckle gets their attention with the tiniest gunshot in the world. Take care of that. Disable the vehicle. The Savoys look more confused than anything, and Mordecai is annoyed at having to deal with another distraction. He smartly splits the group up, going after Freckle himself and leaving the Savoys to cut off the gang's method of escape. Ivy thinks she's got the car fixed and hops in to start the car, only to forget that she needs to crank the engine first. Here we get a wonderful scene of, if you'll ignore the pun, cat and mouse, with Freckle and Mordecai. It's interesting that despite his near-perfect precision and efficiency, Freckle nearly catches Mordecai out here.
Ivy nearly gets the car started, using her left hand on the crank to avoid breaking her wrist. Good technique there. When she's startled by the approach of Seraphine, she runs off to the side door, only to find Nicodem waiting. The sounds of her screams bring Freckle out of his ruthless mindset, and show the one area in which Mordecai wins out over Freckle. Emotional restraint. In his panic to save Ivy, Freckle wastes all his ammo, while Mordecai never takes a shot if he doesn't need to. No! No, 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 no! No! It's possible the only reason he missed in the earlier gunfight was due to Freckle noticing him and suddenly rushing to get the shot off before the chance was lost. It's not 100% his style, and it may be that Freckle was on higher ground throwing off his aim by a fraction. Still, this is a little out of character for Mordecai, and it may just be that he's not perfect and is susceptible to his own ego at times. He may think he's perfectly efficient, but we know he can lose his cool. He may have done so here or may have simply given me the impression that he never takes a shot if he's going to miss, while actually missing more than I thought, i.e. once. Still, in this moment, he gets the upper hand on Freckle, just grazing him, but incapacitating him long enough to close in for the kill. The Savoys are doing the same. Luckily for Freckle and Ivy, Rocky is... <laughs> is Rocky... He's hijacked the earlier excavator, weighed down the controls with sandbags, and is riding it into battle, throwing explosives around like Mardi Gras beads, and reciting deranged poetry like he is frequently wont to do. This poem isn't from the comic, but it's exactly the usual style. The sudden circus comes to town! <laughs> the behemoth in the top hat mouth! Come gather, gather up! See them rain their fire down! <laughs> He's equating his usual chaotic antics to a circus, as we saw in his delusion earlier. Mordecai immediately goes on the defensive, while the Savoys watch Rocky with bemusement and appreciation. Nika seems to approve, while Sarah comments on the idiocy of the action, almost as if giving advice to a friend, despite being enemies. You ejected the first bullet by hand, didn't you? I see what you were trying to do, but testing a technique you've only heard about in the middle of battle wasn't very smart. No, no, that's for another time. As Sarah opens fire on Rocky, her inaccuracy shows, though, and Rocky begins chucking more dynamite. Sarah, dumbfounded, is almost blasted into shreds until Nico knocks her out of the way, and they seem to stay down for the rest of the encounter. Freckle goes in to get Ivy, with this silly little fake out here where his silhouette looks like Mordecai. We learn a little later, though, that this may not have been a bad thing either. Ivy immediately asks Freckle what's going on, helping prop him up as his head wound is disorientating him, and Freckle knows all too well what's causing this ruckus. It seems Ivy knew that Rocky was going a bit mental, but I don't think she expected this. Mordecai is completely unable to get a clear shot due to the sheer amount of chaos Rocky is causing. Rocky, as usual, is his own downfall in this situation, as he whiffs a lob, causing his latest explosive party favour to land back into the excavator's bucket. He wisely evacuates, but his trousers snag on the metal, causing him to faceplant into the mud. This shock to the brain might be what snaps him out of it, or it could be the cascade of cold water that pours forth as the excavator drives into, and then explodes next to, a water tower. The wave of muddy water washes everyone besides Mordecai away, who's the only one to seem too concerned about the water. He reacts like most cats would in real life. In the confusion, Ivy gets the car started and Freckle and her pick up Rocky. Mordecai is the first of the antagonists to get to his feet, and he has a clear shot. He zeroes in, aiming at the driver. But seeing that the driver is Ivy, he lowers his weapon. In this calm moment, Rocky hands Freckle a keepsake for his adventures. Here, Freckle. I got you a souvenir. <laughs> You're supposed to light it first. There's this very strange 
kind of loyalty that we see in Mordecai here. I've mentioned this before. Mordecai has a very prominent loyalty to the higher-ups of the Lackadaisy, and it seems like his respect for Atlas is stopping him from pulling the trigger on Ivy, considering that Ivy is Atlas's goddaughter. Mordecai surveys the desolation as Nico and Sarah finally dig themselves out of a mud bank. Nico snidely comments that Mordecai looks upset, and his tail does give it all away. Another fun little cat-like detail. We cut now to the front of the Lackadaisy speakeasy, the Little Daisy Cafe, where Miss Mitzi May is in the upstairs office partaking in the pastime that cheers her up the most these days, reading obituaries. She does this in the comics because it's genuinely more light-hearted than the reality of her failing business. She's reading it to the ghost of, or portrait of, her recently deceased husband, Atlas. She slowly turns from commenting on the death of a famous actress, whose obituary is actually real, by the way, to the state of the business. She laments how easy the job used to be, with whole caravans of booze-running trucks coming in day after day. Just as she says this, their own booze-runners arrive home, sputtering and leaking coolant. This face says it all. Mitzi makes her way down to the speakeasy, past Horatio, the doorman, and we see the state of the place. <sighs> she makes her way immediately to the bar where Wick sits, sipping his usual draught of poison, and he asks her the rather touchy and obvious question. How's the weather, madam? Ah, right, the difficult business of, a uh, business. Mitzi brings up that Wick's money could help liven the place up, and he says that he can't get involved any more than he already is, as he's a legitimate businessman. This is a plot point from the comics. In the webcomic, Mitzi is constantly in romantic entanglements with Wick, in an attempt to manipulate him into handing over his money to the speakeasy. After one particularly drunken night, she lowers his guard just enough to steal one slip from his checkbook and forges his signature to get the lackadaisy enough to just scrape by for the next few weeks, maybe. The foreseeable future in general. She's not as much of a victim as you may think, initially. Back to the pilot, Zib finally wakes up. As much as he can wake up. Upon hearing Wick say that he needs to be an upstanding citizen, he comments that he's drinking illegal booze. Wick simply deflects this comment by saying that he was beginning to wonder if Zib was actually still breathing with how zonked out he was. For those confused, Zib isn't a drunk, as far as I'm aware. I've seen many reactors think that this particular scene shows Zib as a blackout drunkard, but he's actually completely sober the vast majority of the time. As I said, consciousness is a continuum, not a binary, for Zib. Mitzi asks Zib if he should be playing on stage, with the implication being that he should be playing on stage, rather than sitting around doing nothing. But Zib is a 4D chess kind of savant, and he sees everything as futile, since we're all going to be dead soon. He says that there's no point in playing if there's only three people in the bar. Perhaps having him bent over the bar in this way is somewhat misleading for the uninitiated, but I suppose we still get a good read on his personality through his interactions here, as well as his implied flexibility. How about you, Wick? Shall I serenade you personally? Uh, once I've had a few more illicit beverages, perhaps. We stan a by Pan Icon. Wick's hesitance and implied reticence shows that he may not be open to Zib's advances, but that's also not a no. Wick is open to some drunken experimentation. I told you that the 20s was a time of unparalleled social freedom in America up until then. Mitzi asks the barman for a drink, and this is our intro into Victor. His menacing one-eyed glare from the comics is in full swing here, and Mitzi tries to temper his aggression. She knows he's not used to being... customer-facing, and tries to give some pointers, fruitlessly. Victor, I know it's an adjustment, but the bartender's got to look like someone the patronage can tell their troubles to. More of a confidant, less of a coroner. Try smiling, honey. I love the little details here of Zib putting another cigarette in his mouth, only to realise he's done it wrong and throw it away later. The rum runners trickle in with their handful of intact bottles, and the band lets us know just what they think.
JJ. Sorry. This recurring joke about JJ the trombonist is hilarious. Rocky lays his bottles down and comments that Miss M seems shocked at this situation, as Mitzi tells him that everything he does is a shock. A terrible, terrible shock. Rocky's failed attention takes this as a compliment. Rocky, sweetie, you are nothing if not an exhausting, incomprehensible surprise. Thank you! Here we see Rocky's attention problems come into full swing, as the dripping from the ceiling makes him lose words for a second, and he spends all of Mitzi's comment fiddling with the bottles until the sound of this cork draws his attention. He just like me for real. Mitzi decides to test the booze, since it was supposed to be good stuff. She pours out four shots, and everyone immediately hates it. Mitzi has a good tolerance for liquor, and she still crackles like warm ice. Well, <clears throat> it'll certainly start your engine. Zib says it beats sucking down radiator fluid, and Wick begins tasting it like a connoisseur, picking out the oaky, heady aftertaste of the coffin varnish it was cut with. As Victor makes a joke that they should call it a Sunset Rose Cocktail, which is a joke I don't get, this nice name makes Ivy want to try it. I know Sunset Roses are given out for Valentines, like maybe the Valentine's Day Massacre during Prohibition. It could be a connection there. Or Sunset like the end of a day, to imply the end of your days, i.e. death and coffins and such. It's certainly an ironically sunny name for a depressingly tasteless cocktail. Not even a cocktail, really. It's literally just Canadian whiskey. Here we see Victor's father-like protectiveness kick in as he warns Ivy off of drinking this stuff, at her age especially. She pulls a traditional late teenager move by saying that she's more mature than he thinks, and he has no idea what she went through to get this booze. Of course, Victor knows exactly what she went through. As she tries it, she can't even swallow it, and she hacks up a lung while trying to pretend that it's a classy drink. She offers it to Freckle, and he meows like a cornered cat. Good characterization there. Mmm, sophisticated flavor. Rocky asks everyone their opinions, and everyone grumbles in a it's fine but still terrible kind of answer. Through this strange mumbling chorus, we can hear a few things. Zib saying that he's drunk worse, Victor mumbling something in his native language. For some reason, you can't hear Wick at all, oddly. And Mitzi's the most clear response. She asks Rocky if this paltry amount is all they got for their money, and Rocky is forced to admit that they had a run-in with the rival gang. The gang all talk over each other, and this is something they do in the comic a lot. They describe each of their experiences, and each response gives a good view into their mindset. Rocky is worried about the financial impact on Miss M by commenting about the spent ammo, also making his the most roundabout answer. Freckle is worried about the desecrated graves and the spiritual impact on his immortal soul. Ivy is the most carefree about the damage caused, while keeping everything straight. Rocky finishes off by circuitously saying that it was some old rivals they ran into. He then specifically walks over to Wick, whose quarry he purposefully destroyed, to imply such a thing to him. He mentions dynamite and heavy machinery, which you can only likely find in one or two places around St. Louis. St. Louis, I, I still don't know. They finally finish up their report by saying Ivy fixed the car, but like I said, she's not a mechanic. Even Rocky's violin is saved. Well, mostly. Mitzi begins gently explaining to Rocky that they can't keep the place afloat with this pocket change's worth of bad booze. But she hasn't got the heart to go all in on him. She never does. JJ's playing the last post on his trombone again, and this time everyone tells him to stop. I know you did your best, honey, but we can't keep running ourselves ragged and into the red to bring Omega. What I mean is, I, I don't see how this... Uh... JJ. 
Mitzi deflects her concerns and cheers Rocky up. She says they all need some music right now to cheer them up, and it seems Zib is actually capable of getting on his feet, and decides to play some music now that the minimum number of people in the place can constitute a party. It's also likely he does actually care about the morale of those in the place, as we know he has a bit of a soft heart from the comics. Ivy invites Freckle to dance, and he tries to get out of it, desperately. You owe me a dance. I do? Yes, I've decided. You know the Charleston? No. The Lindy Hop? No. The Roundabout? The Jingle Jangle? The Noodle? I haven't heard of Noodle. Victor is still a protective dad, and we get my personal favourite character detail from the comics. Mitzi's little arm pats. She does this all the time in the comics, and I don't know why I was so happy to see it animated. She wanders over to the side as the band begins to play, holding the necklace Atlas gave her and thinking about the good old days. After the credits roll, we see the Marigold gang, requesting a pickup from their boss. This guy's Asa Sweet, and he's outwardly a lovable and affable guy, but also a ruthless mobster willing to bury Lackadaisy if it becomes more than a thorn in his side. Mordecai here alludes to the presence of Dominic Drago, and how the extra attention Lackadaisy will bring on them will be bad for business. And he also alludes to the funeral home double-dealing with the Lackadaisy crew. Asa is prepared to tie up some loose ends here. In this final shot, we see Wick coming back to his ruined quarry with horror and pain in his eyes. So, that's the pilot. It's an amazing little thing, really, translating the style, the atmosphere, and the story of the comic quite nicely. A few things missing are the more unhinged version of Rocky that we get in the later part of the comic, the more seductive and manipulative femme fatale version of Mitzi, Freckle's frankly frightening determination and bloodthirstiness from the later parts of the comic, and really any amount of Victor at all. However, this pilot foreshadows the Arbogast connection to the Lackadaisy and the Marigold, the presence of Dominic Drago and the whole plot with him and his undercover agents, and as such implies Mordecai's independence from the Marigold crew. There's a lot this pilot does right, and I can't really think of very much that it does wrong. However, there are some animated shorts to go over. So, let's. Shorts. We start with Breakthrough, which doesn't really give us that much. It's only 45 seconds long, and gives us an animated look into Freckle and Rocky's life as children. This is something the side comics delved into quite deeply, actually. But Rocky lost his parents at a very young age, and went to live with his cousin and aunt. It's no wonder they're so close, since they grew up together like siblings. It's also no wonder that Aunt Nina is so frayed on every side, since Rocky is a lot to deal with. In this shot, one of Rocky's notorious science experiments happens. In the side comics, we've seen him shave his cousin's whole face for fun, which is where he gets the nickname Freckle from. We've seen him chase his cousin around the yard with a sack of syrupy pancakes and some glue to see how it would attract the bees. But in this shot, we see Rocky experimenting with his pain tolerance, as he decides to dislocate both his arms just to see what would happen. Rocky barely reacts, and simply asks Freckle to pose his arms for him as his aunt rushes him to a doctor. In the next shot, we see some of what we've seen a lot in the side comics, actually. Mordecai and Victor's interactions before Mordecai left the Lackadaisy. In this shot, we see them playing chess, and watch as their brazen incompatibility leads to violence. Mordecai watches Victor make a chess move, obsessing with trying to figure out which of his many learned techniques Victor is trying to use, while Victor is just playing as the wind takes him in order to win. Mordecai is book learning, while Victor is street smart. Mordecai learned chess through books, while Victor learned to play in a in trench. trench. Oddly enough, we see this as a pastime that they share a lot, though the main comic to show this off was one of the odd ones where Tracy drew them as humans rather than cats, where Victor looks like... Oh no. Rereading parts of the comic for later parts of this review, I actually learned that this whole chess thing that they do is something that's mentioned in the main comic too. It's a way to pass the time on long stakeout missions. Finally, we get the short that was released less than an hour ago at time of writing. Ingenu. In. Ingenu? In. Ingenu? This one. 
which is named after a trope from old-fashioned cinema meaning an innocent girl. This is in reference to Ivy, as the short focuses on her life growing up around the speakeasy. The short is much longer and gives us a bit more to chew on. We get to meet Ivy's father for the first time, Ruby Pepper. He's a bundle of energy and a suave man who seems to know exactly what to say at all times. He's seemingly a friend of Atlas's, and wants to sell him a brand new car. Ivy laments this, as she loves some time with her father, and now without the car they'll have to spend a lot of time on a crowded train to get home. We don't really hear much about her father in the comics, and we never see him, with the way that she talks about him implying that they had a minimal relationship. She seems to like and respect him, but not much more. Ruby begins chatting everyone up, though not many members of the crew seem receptive to this. Victor doesn't even mumble from under his car. Mordecai resentfully watches as Ruby calls him Killer Joe, and Atlas and Mitzi politely welcome him. Ruby mentions his wife having some kind of problem, and we hear her name for the first time, Effie. We never learn what's wrong with her, but seeing as we never hear from her again, even in the comics, it's likely that she's not well here. And that's the reason he missed hanging out with the crew for New Year's, as Mitzi says in this short here. For a moment, I was really hoping that we'd hear Atlas talk for the first time, but this is still kept from us. Atlas hugs Ruby and throws his hat onto Ivy. We've not even seen a speech bubble from Atlas in the comics. So even in a non-auditory medium, Atlas has remained a silent, imposing figure. We have no idea what kind of man he is outside of what other characters say he is. Obviously, Mitzi loves him a great deal, but she also potentially kills him. Elsa and Bobby have very differing opinions on the man, Elsa saying that he was quiet and calm and gentle, whereas Bobby chimes in saying that that calmness was covering up a Machiavellian calculating streak. Ivy adjusts Atlas's hat to wear it properly as Atlas, Mitzi and Ruby go off to talk about the car. Ivy wanders into the garage behind the Little Daisy Cafe to talk to the hatchet men. At this point, she doesn't know the ins and outs of the business, and despite separating Ivy from it, we can still hear her father alluding to it while pitching the car to Atlas, especially if you have subtitles on. Ivy goes over to Mordecai, who seemingly has no way to handle children. He, again, despises being called Ruby's nickname of Killer Joe. And here we get a tidbit that I never realised, even though there was enough evidence for it in the comics. Mordecai is the bookkeeper for the business. We see him poring over ledgers and books in the comic, but somehow I never realised that he had a legitimate job description on top of his illicit one. We know he's smart, and he's keen on precision, so this does make sense. But it may also be a subtle hint to the inherent racism of the time, since the one they hired to keep track of the numbers and the money for the business is also Jewish. Potentially something to read into there, but that's the 1920s for you. Ivy pushes Mordecai to talk about his injury. His arm is in a sling, which I've neglected to mention up until now, and in his haste to push her away, he reveals his 1911 under his arm. She asks why a guy who adds up numbers all day would need a gun, and he makes this wonderful joke. I subtract numbers too. Imagine people are numbers, and you get the joke. Ivy, which is interesting for her age, seems to understand that this joke has a hidden meaning, if not getting the hidden meaning itself and Mordecai begins to freak out, realising just how smart Ivy is for her age, and understanding that he can't BS his way out of this one. Oh no, it's precocious. Ivy, hon. Luckily for him, Mitzi chimes in, asking Ivy if she wants a drink from the cafe. She refuses, opting to stay and talk to Mordecai, who's taken this distraction as an opportunity to hide somewhere in the garage. Ivy moves on to pestering Victor, He's his usual cold self, but over the course of this conversation it's clear that he has much more time for Ivy than he does for anyone, especially her father, for instance. This is consistent with the comic as well, as most people don't even get a syllable out of Victor unless he's angry with you, where he'll talk quite comfortably to Ivy, for some reason. Here we see in the subtitles that Ivy's dad got this car as the result of a gentle shakedown, implying that he's into some dirty dealings himself. We see Victor's work on the car includes fixing armour plates to the inside of the car's doors, hinting at their true line of work, as well as the claw marks and bullet holes in the upholstery that implies that these cars were the fruits of a not-so-gentle shakedown. 
Ivy comments that the plates make the car much more sturdy, seemingly ignoring or not noticing the claw marks and bullet holes. Ivy now begins whining about how so few of the lackadaisy crew want to talk to her, and here Victor becomes slightly less monosyllabic. Or I guess monosyllabic. <laughs> God, that was terrible. Ivy seems to think that Mordecai not wanting to talk about his busted arm is rather sus, and Victor just says that he fell down some stairs, which, if my theory is right, is not inaccurate. He continues the line, much to Mordecai's disapproval, by saying he was stupid and roller skating indoors, and that's why he fell. Ivy seems to know that this is BS, but entertains it because it's the most fun that she's had all day. Ivy's next question is about how Victor lost his eye, asking him if it was the war. Victor again comes up with a colourful lie to entertain her, saying that an ice cream scoop malfunctioned and took out his eye. As Ivy tells him that he's a bad liar, Mordecai detects the growing demoness in their midst and backs out of the garage. We get confirmation of this as Ivy says that she'll teach Victor how to lie well. We know from the comics that she can be a touch manipulative at times, and it seems this started at an early age, and Mordecai could see this right away. Victor makes a joke, mistaking her offer for teaching him how to use an ice cream scoop properly, and she comments that his jokes suck too, beginning to tell him a good joke. For some reason I haven't fully ruminated on yet, the moment she begins the joke with a young boy running to his mother, Victor tells her to get out of the garage telling her it's dangerous. He blames the sharp objects and heavy tools, and shouts at her to move. At this exact moment, the childlike music in the background cuts off. Sharp, heavy things. Tools. Go! We know in the comics that Victor actually has a wife and a daughter somewhere, but that he's kept them extremely distant so as to keep them safe from his criminal dealings. It's entirely possible that being reminded of a young child and a mother makes him realise that he shouldn't be entertaining the idea of a child being anywhere near this business, even if it's not one of his. This is potentially why he is so kind to Ivy, because she reminds him of his daughter. She does take Victor's advice to move, but only to the corner of the room, where the original bullet-ridden door of this car lays. She looks at it, looks back at Victor checking the hinges of the new door, and a solemn drone begins. As she begins to approach the door earlier, the subtitles specifically say that Ruby didn't have to deal with any bodies to get the car, as he was dealing with nobodies and didn't have to. Right at that moment, Mitzi calls everyone over for a photo, dragging Mordecai behind her. In the comic where we see Mordecai doing the books for the cafe, we see that Mitzi is a fan of photographic mementos. As they all line up, Ivy goes in for the kill, saying to them, They're robbers or gangsters or something? You can see their reactions plainly. She then blackmails them, saying that she'll keep their secret for some pocket change. Victor comments that she's as much of a gangster as they are and the photo is taken. The way this short is framed implies that this is potentially the first major step in the Pepper's association with the Lackadaisy. It seems Ruby knows Atlas, but this is potentially the first time they cement their relationship for the long term, making Ivy a solid part of the usual crew. I have to assume this based on the way that Victor talks to her so coldly here, and how Mordecai seems to have not developed any loyalty to her yet. Now how did Mordecai get injured? Why are they fixing up all these new cars? Well, there is a moment in the main comic in which Bobby tells Ivy about Mordecai and Victor's past. It seems after Atlas picks them up, their first big job is ripping off a lodge in the mountains. I've dubbed this scene since it's so fun. Here we go. Forgive me. The reason, actually is because I'm a Pepper, Ruby Pepper's girl. My dad and Atlas go way back, you know? When I was a kid and my dad had some business with Atlas, he'd sometimes take me along to St. Louis to the Lackadaisy. It was like being royalty. Everyone was so nice to me. I guess because Atlas was my godfather. Anyway, now I'm grown, I decided to stay there. I see. Well, I'm sorry for what happened to Atlas. He was... Difficult to read, 
but he always had a mild, soft-spoken way about him. Soft-spoken and positively Machiavellian. It was a no-holds-barred situation when he had Victor and the other one along. Who, Mordecai? When were they all here? Many times. Especially in the early days when Volstead was the newest craze and Atlas was carving out a foothold. Contrarily, our post-mortem services were a bit slower to catch on in the wild. Profit was a pittance, but all Atlas saw was the halo of potential. See, these Interlands are doubly blessed with a dearth of law enforcement and an MKT rail depot. Atlas, likely with the aid of your dad, did some string pulling to make sure the train arrived burdened with bottles. Old log cabin, Cuban rum, the real Mackays. I bet it's paying for that higher education of yours now. Anyway, as you seldom get a sideways look loading long boxes off a train and into a hearse, it was our place to pick it up and store it. For a broker's percentage. We were altogether proud of the brilliance in this little arrangement. Until some local cattle rustling train robbing rabble figured on a liquor being easier to rustle and chaps like us being easier to rob. And they did that. They shot our organ player. It was right about then Atlas first brought Lefty and Righty up here to sort things out. They just sat themselves down at the one general store in town and played chess until, inevitably, one of those roughnecks showed up needing supplies. He was understandably reticent concerning the whereabouts of his mates, but discovered he had a good many things to discuss from the interior of a preoccupied pine box. It would probably be in your better interest to stop screaming and start enunciating while we can still hear you. That's when things got really interesting. It turned out this lot was playing cowboys and gangsters with some boys from the city, peddling to them what they stole from us. This city gang, some Sicilians or something, well, Atlas happened to know that they were in the midst of a turf war with a then-blossoming establishment you might know as Marigold. All right, all right. What was I getting at? Oh, the lodge tucked back here in the nowhere. The country mice and city mice had been meeting there to make their exchanges. Newly privy to that, Atlas decided he'd make a rather bold gesture of confronting our nuisance and doing Marigold an unsolicited favour. In the business of bitter enemies, it doesn't hurt to make a friend, yeah? Anyway, in that spirit, the captive cattle thief was returned to his friends. You just gonna stand there in the threshold? I, I, Where the hell you been? Smell like death. You're a souvenir from the war. Then Victor and Mordecai made their way through the place like a minor tornado. Victor was something of a remnant from the war himself. And Mordecai, well, come to think of it, he couldn't have been very much older than you are at the time. He'd had an early start, though. Supposedly still in knee pants when he began keeping books for grifters and gamblers in New York. But things must have soured for him there. Atlas said when he crossed his path, he was looking rather worse for wear. Riding a getaway train towards Chicago or Detroit with some deeply unhappy associates on his heels. It wouldn't surprise me to learn that left to his own agencies, he'd brought his troubles on himself. For all his qualifications with books and odds and percentages and what. He'd always been about as personable as a bespectacled barbed wire post. And likely tallied up more enemies and friends. I've heard it said some long ago incident left a little bit of lead rattling around in his cranium. And carved him that wonky streak. I never had the gall to ask him myself if that were true. I can tell you, Atlas didn't see the uh, 
personality problem as a problem, so much as a facility worth fostering, however. So, as the story I know goes, Atlas settled some of his pursuing grievances, gave him the veritable shirt off his back, placed him on his feet, set him to work. And from what I gathered, the boy had been learning fast. Okay. I'd Victor, I figured, get the more of a bundle of nerves and a crack brain. If he was anything like my mates, the ones who weren't numbed or shell-shocked, he'd gone home from the front and back to work resembling electric wire with all the sheathing stripped off. And that must have made whatever labour conflict erupted around him something of a powder keg situation. Because he didn't waste any time barreling into some political turmoil, the sort that comes to blows. As I understand it, the dock workers' faction of the great unwashed he'd settled in with threw an unhappy party when the Palmer raids cost them some union leaders. The strike breakers and the authorities arrived uninvited, of course, and they all had themselves a great big row. That's how he lost the eye, tossing the constabulary about like ragdolls. It took a well-aimed pry bar to put that fire out long enough that they could subdue him. Or so Atlas recounted. Whatever business he had at the riverfront that day was superseded by the event, so he joined the spectators. Victor's performance must have left an impression, as Atlas went to some trouble turning up a lawyer for him. One who held aloft Victor's national service, against his former countrymen no less, to allay any silly ideas he represented some foreign breed of anarchist monster. It must have worked, because his little sojourn in prison was cursory compared to some others. Afterwards, he reunited with Atlas to work off the debt. By the time his indenture was up, well, I suppose he'd crossed some lines into no man's land, without any prospects ahead of him or much remaining of whatever he had left behind, he stayed on with Atlas, where he had some place and purpose. And luckily for us, T, he'd been most of the muscle behind the momentum that got us off and running in those early years. And with that, the fray at the lodge was more a proper slaughter. Atlas got his lost liquor back, or most of it, thank you. Made off with our robber's would-be profits, and a small fleet of dead men's vehicles too. After that, Mordecai followed Atlas back to the city like his ferocious little shadow. At the Marigold Room, Atlas busied himself leveraging goodwill with an old acquaintance among the management, as well as indulging some personal interests. I do believe that's where he met his wife. Victor stayed with us for a while, accompanying us on pickups, and keeping that one eye on things round here in case we had any trouble with lingering loose ends. What trouble we had was little trouble indeed. The Reverend and I owed a great deal to him. He's practically part of the oh, family. Oh, for the love of... Stop talking! This could be the event that happened before this one. Ivy's dad has some dealings with Atlas, but now that they've got themselves a proper foothold, he's throwing himself into it properly. Mordecai is still recovering from his arm injury, which Elsa fixed up in this side comic. They have this new fleet of cars that need repairs, and likely they have recently acquired this one through some violent means, potentially getting this particular cattle rustler here before they got the rest of them. And Victor is still a bundle of nerves as he hasn't properly mellowed into his fatherly role. One thing I'm just now noticing is that the general store that Mordecai and Victor play chess in during this short, and that's mentioned in this flashback, the one that's seen in this side comic of them as humans, is likely the same general store that Fish and Weaselface are hiding out in, and that Rocky and Freckle stumble into in these bits of the comic. You can even see the chessboard in this one panel. I believe, since they're talking about New Year's in this short, that Mordecai and Victor being in this place over Christmas would make sense, hence the decorations in this human side comic. Not to mention that they specifically said that Victor was back from the hinterlands. Victor! Back from the hinterlands? Killer Joe? 
which is how Bobby describes the area that this whole thing went down in. Okay, so this is going to be pretty slapdash and uh, rambling, probably, because um, I literally just had this thought in the shower while getting ready for work, and I've got uh, about um, an hour and 40 minutes to kind of collate this information and then get ready for work. Um, but um, I'm, I'm probably going to forget things, I'm probably going to ramble, but uh, I think it's rather important to say. And editor me, hello editor me, will probably add in some text boxes to uh, fill in the gaps that I leave. But basically I kind of came to the conclusion from the ingenu, however you pronounce it, short, that um, it seems like um, the comic that I dubbed, uh, that, that specific part of the main comic that I dubbed, that reads to me like it's kind of Mordecai's first big job with the Atlas crew, with the Lackadaisy crew. And um, that's just kind of recontextualized the whole kind of social structure of the speakeasy, I guess. Um, because uh, a few things, I'll have to go over them in order. Firstly, if this is Mordecai's first kind of big job with Atlas and his crew, that would kind of imply that Ivy and her father have been part of Atlas's crew since before even he was? Because Ivy's father, um, he, he he seems to be kind of pally with Atlas as they begin the short, whereas if Mordecai is just now getting off of his first major role with the Lackadaisy, it would imply that Atlas and, uh, I, uh, Atlas and Ivy's dad have had interactions since before Mordecai was a hatchet man with him, which is interesting, because it implies that Ivy's actually been there longer than Mordecai has, but that does kind of make sense considering that she is technically Alice's family. Um, it would also imply why there is a bit of respect for her there, um, even though he doesn't show it in this uh, short. Um, but then another thing I've kind of noticed about him is... Uh, backing up, actually. not Like, when I was talking about um, Ivy's dad potentially having, you know, a minor role in Atlas's group, maybe like, you know, having some minor dealings but cementing their relationship properly at the end of this short. Um, I don't think that's the case now that I think about it because Ivy's dad, Ruby, I keep, I keep forgetting his name, Ruby seems to have known about the Hinterlands job because why else would he say, hey, Victor, back from the Interlands, if he didn't know that Victor was there protecting the shipments after the shack had been hit? Like, that's some pretty in-depth knowledge of Atlas's organization to give out to somebody who's kind of a bit part in it, so he must be a bit of a bigger player than I thought. Um, you know, because it, it implies that not only did Ruby know that they were going to hit the cabin in the woods, but he also knew that Victor was going to stay behind to protect their shipments from that point on, and he's only now commenting that Victor has just got back from that job. That's why he only addresses Victor about the Hinterlands and not Mordecai, because Mordecai's been around for weeks, nursing his dead arm. Victor! Back from the Hinterlands? Killer Joe? Like, that... Th that seems like something that you wouldn't tell to a much lower down member of your gang. You would kind of keep that information from them, especially if they weren't like an official part of the gang. But he knows, so he must be more integrated. Um, but speaking of Mordecai again, um, I kind of, I've kind of realized that there's a character arc that is implied with Mordecai. Like I've mentioned, he, he isn't perfectly efficient. He isn't able to switch off that emotional aspect completely. He's just a lot better at it than Freckle is currently, because Freckle is very early on in his career. So if we were to compare him along his criminal life to other characters we've seen, when he is on the train um, being chased by New York gangsters and Atlas helps him out by giving him a pistol, he has very little control over his emotion in that scene. He is a wreck. He is like so stressed out that his nose bleeds. He is writing a goodbye letter to his mother. Okay, so I just got completely derailed by a phone call. But um, 
basically Mordecai in that moment when we see him during the sort of voodoo party in the main comic that flashback is kind of akin to where Freckle is at the moment like completely unable to keep his emotions in check and as a result that gets him in trouble the next time we see him on the timeline would be the hinterlands job where he has a bit more control of his emotions but as we saw from him tumbling down the stairs um he still has to kind of he he can't quite hold it all back he has to let it out and um he as a result can be quite a effective hitman because that means that he is quite um vicious but it also means that he loses control at times he's also not quite as detail orientated at that moment because like he he misses the dude hiding behind the chair um but he's getting there because he sees the guy going up the stairs he sees the guy the same guy coming out of the side door um i'm going to be putting pictures on the screen so you can tell um i'm telling this to editor me not not you but um the, you know this the, this shows that he's on his way he's at this at that point he is about equal to victor i would say and that is also the same point that we see him at in the Ingenue uh, short, where he gets very worked up about being grilled by this kid, because he doesn't like kids, and he kind of... I, I don't... Th I think maybe there is an element of him not wanting to get a kid like himself involved, because he's he's been through it, he doesn't quite want to see that happen to another kid. Um, but there's still that disconnected hitman element until he realizes that this kid is precocious and is actually unraveling what they do and that's why he's so shocked when she just flat out says you guys are gangsters so he is his his method of distancing himself there isn't just to just excuse himself it's to freak out and run away the moment that this child looks away from him which is a bit more emotionally unraveled than victor but i i think Bobby describes them well in the, in the story. He is learning fast, but he is still kind of green. Whereas Victor is a little bit of a bundle of nerves at times. In this, not, not nerves as in nervous, but he has very strong emotions, but he tends to hide that under a grim facade, much like Mordecai. We actually see in the side comics that Victor and Mordecai have some kind of camaraderie when they are both hatchet men for the Lackadaisy. Not really uh, friendship there's a like i say camaraderie they they work well ish together um they like they they get along to a degree they have understandings but their idiosyncrasies do cause them to butt heads and that can be a bit of a problem but he works better with victor than he does with nico and sarah and I think the the thing is, Lackadaisy, he had friends there, friends in the the only way that Mordecai can have friends. So he was he was kind of comfortable with the odd occasional emotional freakout because they were quite chill about it in this in the side comics. Whenever we see his sort of OCD tendencies interact with people when we see his sort of emotional dysregulation interacting with people, his social nuance not being quite what it should be. People just kinda they they, they they're they very chummy about it. They giggle about it. They they tell odd jokes and he doesn't quite like that. But at least it's not them, you know, abusing those tendencies for the sake of screwing him over, trying to get him killed. Like, you know, that sort of thing. And I feel like the moment that whatever happens with Atlas happens, and Atlas dies, Victor, for some reason, does something that requires him getting kneecapped, like, that completely changes Mordecai, and he becomes the Mordecai we know, where he is unable to show any emotional weakness. It is a wall... Uh, oh god, I can't say the word wall without thinking of the bloody Pink Floyd album or the Nostalgia Critic version but the um, the he builds this wall to try and deflect against his now uh, new work 
colleagues from abusing his tendencies and getting one over on him because he he now has no safety net he has no friends he has no camaraderie he is purely in a mercenary role with these guys and he has to completely hide away everything that he was comfortable with showing before and it's a it's a mixture of him being hurt by his work and him being extremely tactical i think so that that sort of says a lot about Mordecai's character, and I think we only really were able to fully put that together thanks to Ingen Yu. But there were hints to it in the, you know, Hinterland's job arc of the comic in this, this flashback we saw. Um And I think there were elements of it in the side comics, as I've mentioned, with comics like just off the top of my head, Valentino or um that that one where he loses his cufflinks after killing an entire room of people. That that or, or the or the one where they are travelling somewhere to kill a dude and he's just rambling about symmetry. That that is that shows his emotional dysregulation, his camaraderie with Victor, as strange as it is. And I think that has kind of given us a timeline of his personality to a degree. So it's this entire short and rereading the Hinterlands arc has kind of recontextualized both Ruby Pepper and Mordecai, and a little bit of Victor. Like, I think he is still in Mordecai's middle stage. I think he is able to show that emotion to some degree, but he hides it away under a gruff visage. He shows it a little bit to Ivy. Um, Mitzi, I think, can see it, even though he refuses to show it, and everyone else is completely detached from that. The only emotion they get to see is anger. Um... Although I do think in the very beginnings of the comic, he tries to reach out to Rocky, but he kind of sees Rocky as a little bit of a lost cause to some degree, because he he sees the sort of obsession he has with Mitzi, and and I don't I don't think he has much communication with Rocky from that point on. I don't know if it's out of choice or if it's just how the story has gone, but in this very beginning scene, he does kind of warn Rocky away from getting too involved. And that sort of that's that starts the running joke of referring to Mitzi as a bear trap, or a, a bunny in a box of bear traps, or something like that. I'll, I'll have to put it up on screen so you can see. But it's a running joke. That scene I showed earlier of Rocky and Frecky, Fre Rocky and Frecky, what is that? Rocky and Freckle going into the um, the general store in defiance. I'm, I was trying to remember the town name. They, when they wander into the Defiance General store, Rocky literally buys a completely superfluous, to quote the happening, uh, bear trap just because it reminds him of Mitzi. Like that, that sort of that that obsession is what Victor was warning him against, and I think it's because he's in that middle stage. Whereas the younger generation of the Lackadaisy crew, Ivy, Freckle, Rocky, they are kind of still forming, and. I, I think if we were to sort of pin them to different characters, I don't think Rocky can be pinned to anything. Ivy, I don't know. I think she's also kind of in a class of her own. But I think Freckle could be on the fast track to being a, a Mordecai or a Victor. Um, and if he, if he wants to keep his... Sorry, there's a bunch of crumbs on my desk. If, if he wants to keep his soft boy personality... He he has to really fight for it, but he he's kind of in the wrong line of work for that, <laughs> because as we've seen from Victor and Mordecai, the moment you show that kind of weakness, you get capped, and that is exactly what happens in the pilot. So I think this this short and rereading this whole comic thing has kind of recontextualized those characters for me, and I really do need to reread the entire comic because last time I read it was four years ago and whilst I enjoyed it and retained a lot of it I don't I think I was reading one level and I need to start reading the next level you know what I mean like it's it's a very layered story in a lot of ways and uh only rereading elements of it now am I starting to pick up on a lot of the nuance that is actually in the story, which is why I recommended at the beginning that you should be reading the comic. Um But yeah, that's my that's my unscripted post shower thought ramble. Uh back to pre recorded me from like uh two months ago. Production. The animation in these shorts has always 
been amazing, especially in the pilot as well. The deliberate style to make the characters retain their sketch lines and guides is super interesting to me. It almost seems like the crew wants us to know that this is an animated project. In this time of super pristine 3D animated projects, or even, god forbid, AI animations, this is very refreshing. The combination of 3D backgrounds with 2D characters isn't as jarring as one might think, especially after getting used to it, and it turns out the comics have experimented with this too, as this earlier comic I showed of Mordecai was their first experimentation into 3D backgrounds. They haven't really done it since, it seems, but it's interesting. When the animation needs to be fluid, it is. When it needs to be slow and ponderous, it is. But one thing I noticed is how little the animation has the has-been problem of characters becoming frozen after their funny or interesting facial animation is done being funny. This show actually has constant background details, where characters you aren't focusing on have hilarious reactions, character moments, or funny faces in the background. This was something the comics did as well. The music is something special too. The first song to stick out, of course, is Rocky's violin. It's attention-grabbing, even despite it being nothing more than a collection of soul-warming stings from the strings. Is old the thing to call what rings the vernal heart of Wester lore? It brings us brassy, myth-made kings! And preponderance of... The next song also grabs everyone's attention, known as Olive Branch by Sepia Tonic. This is a bizarre but very welcome combination of electro swing with a dubstep breakdown. These rumbling trills in the middle really give me early 2010s vibes, very much bringing back dormant memories of searching for dubstep compilations on YouTube back in the day. Next we have Sunset Rose Cocktail by M. Gewehr. Monsieur Gewehr? I don't know. Either way, more electro swing bliss with a wonderfully atmospheric lead-in. It's interesting that in the whole pilot, this is the second song, and it's the credits. I quite like this one, although I do prefer Olive Branch's energy. Next is Feathers and Fringe by Albert Marlowe, which is, from what I could tell with my admittedly minor amount of research, royalty-free swing music that they got to finish off their credit sequence with after the mid credit scene of the Marigolds. It's serviceable and, and very fun just to have in the background. The last song on the official soundtrack released by the crew isn't actually in the pilot, and this is something I love about them. It's a recording from the 1920s, 1926 specifically, of an actual band from the time playing some music of a period. They just wanted to put it in there for fun. It's really cool hearing a period piece played here. The voice actors are amazing in this. I have zero complaints about any of them. I'm sure none of them will be familiar to me at all. First we have Michael Kovach, who... Wait... Ow. 
much. Ooh, such an insult. Let me know when you come up with something creative to call me, you sack of poorly packaged horse shit. Tell the missus I said hi. Schnuckums. Yeah, he's in this one too. I hear he's also in Murder Drones as well, but I haven't watched it. All I know about it is that it's apparently good, and the Reddit fanbase is just as weirdly sexual as the has-been fanbase is, so it seems to be a typical internet fandom. Michael Kovach is capable of bringing a smug-sounding veneer to Rocky that immediately falls away once head trauma is involved. We know that he can sound smug and energetic as he did in Has Been Hotel, but in this performance he's able to show off his amazing talent for gremlin vibes. The vigour and vehemence he provides in this moment with Rocky and the excavator is really worth giving another listen. Ooh. Oh, the world is full of magic things. I just need a ticket to ride. The sudden circus comes to town! <laughs> the behemoth and the top hat clown! Gather, gather all around. See them rain their fire down. <laughs> you can brandish up your whip and chain, but the circus trains a blazing tail. Said the clown with derriere. We'll make our three rings anywhere. This is exactly what I pictured for Rocky. It's so different from other roles that I've heard him in that it really shows just what kind of range Mike has. Belshazzar Rusepe is not the voice I initially found for Freckle in my head. I imagined him being a bit more high-pitched, maybe just one degree of nasal and just a bit younger. Listening to this performance, though, it's perfect for him. He's able to capture both Freckle's neurotic worrying and bloodthirsty cackling in the same minute without dropping the ball. Ah. Oh, no, no, no! Yes, yes, yes! No, no! Don't be modest! I, 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 uh... Play us a symphony! <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I know that there was likely a more than a minute between these two takes, but still, he can do both. I have no doubt that he'd be able to capture more of Freckle's quiet confidence that we see in the comics if this ever goes any further than just shorts. Lisa Remold as Ivy is amazing, too. She has the exact sort of voice that I pictured for Ivy, and she's able to age down her voice slightly for young Ivy. She can bring knowing and smug manipulation, even as young Ivy, that lets me know that she's not just a youthful voice that they picked out for her. She can pull all elements of this character. Come on, you owe me a dance. I do? Yes, I decided. You know the Charleston? No. The Lindy Hop? No. The Roundabout? The Jingle Jangle? The Tasty Noodle? What do you need the gun for if you're just adding numbers? Someone show as Mordecai is a fun little addition, actually. Someone has been doing dubs for Lackadaisy comics for years now, and having him on as Mordecai is so fun. I remember watching a few of his dubs back when I was making my own and thinking he was much better at this than I was. Uh, this was before he was fully announced as the role, by the way. He captures the cold and calculating elements of Mordecai perfectly, but I know he's capable of a good freakout, which he will be required to do in the future if there's more official dubs and more shorts, or potentially a full series. We have seen hints of this in the new short, as well as a couple of comic dubs. The official ones, even. Yes. What happened to you? No, it, Did that, you that's yourself? none of your concern. Is it broken? Can I see it? You are entirely too close. But you want to take over driving back there? No. Especially now that you have alleviated us of our windshield. The Pelagati attack? The archizer Meyer counter gambit? Der Hammerschlag, the Zugzwang Zigzag, the Poached Penguin, the Drunken Tartakauer, some half-cocked variation of the Dizzy Whippet defense? Checkers. Benny Latham as Seraphine is perfect. She can capture her menace, her chaotic vibe, her intimidation, her humor, and her jovial, if frightening, aura without breaking a stride. Her accent and dialect brings her more to life than the comics ever could, to the point where reading her dialogue in the comic makes me think that she's actually really blandly written when compared to Benny's performance. It could just be hearing this energy doesn't compare to the odd de instead of the in a speech bubble, you know? Oh, you don't like how we play? How about you stop spectating and throw in, Chef? 
or do we have to worry about you getting sentimental about old times? Excuse me! We got some live ones tonight. <laughs> now we come to a complex topic for me personally. This requires a little bit of a personal anecdote, so bear with me. I was in a Discord call in the Lackadaisy server a few years back. I'm no longer in that server, by the way. And they do these strange things every now and again, at least I think they still do, they definitely did at the time, where Tracy and the crew would hop into a voice call every few months or so, and the fans could join and type into a chat, but they would be muted. This was a really fun way to meet the stars when the pilot was first being announced and everyone was being cast and stuff like that. I was in one of these calls at 3am due to the time difference, making a Minecraft replica of the R101 airship while the crew was one-on-one -on -one hopping into the call. This was before Nico or Sarah's VAs were properly announced, but on this occasion, simultaneous to their announcement, they hopped on call and showed off their talent. And of course, we were all blown away. I was big into an electro swing phase at this time, and I'd stumbled across the band Big Bad Voodoo Daddy recently. I thought this name perfectly fit Nico, so I put it in the chat as a silly little joke when Nico was doing his thing. I'm not sure if this was a name floating around for him already, sometime beforehand, but I never saw anyone using it before I posted that joke, and it's still a popular nickname for him to this day. I'm not saying I'm the genesis for that joke, but I'd love it if I were. Moments before the call ended, all the VAs were plugging themselves, as you can imagine, and everyone had just been calling Nico's VA Malcolm the whole time. So when he gave his social media names, I suddenly recognised the name. Malcolm Ray. The name bounced around my head for a long while before hitting a positive node, and I asked in the chat, Is he the same Malcolm Ray from Nostalgia Critic? And he replied, yeah. Though, I don't remember if I was the only one asking, probably not, but I was a little stunned that this was the same guy, as I had no idea that he had a VA career. I knew more about his fursuit than his voice acting. This is where we get into some potentially dangerous territory. I don't remember when this whole voice chat happened, but I'd stopped watching Nostalgia Critic a few years before this call, since I stopped finding him funny. I remember it was before he released his review of The Wall, so it might have been right in the midst of everything, because The Wall was basically a response to everything, but it was only after his Wall review that I learned about the Change the Channel controversy. Whilst learning about this, I learned an alarmingly large number of his employees were complicit in the abuse and conspiracy that went on in the Channel Awesome office. But the one name I never heard mentioned was Malcolm Ray. I really, really hope that he isn't complicit in all that junk, because not only is Malcolm Ray seemingly a great guy, a veritable fairy icon, an amazing voice actor, but he's perfect for Nicodem. Nico is brought to life by Ray's performance. He can capture the suave and smug tones one reads in Nico's comic lines, and his accent and dialect is perfect for the role. Once more, I find the comic slightly lacking after hearing an authentic performance from Malcolm. Hearing him, I know he can pull off the more intimidating version of Nico that we see in the comics, on top of his more jovial side. If anything, the fact that Nico stays jovial while doing terrifying things makes him somewhat scarier, and I know Malcolm can pull that off. Looks like we got some live ones tonight. <laughs> what the hell is this? Child, this 11 kinds of stupid. Hi. He also plays JJ, which I can't comment on since he only has one word as his character in, in this pilot. JJ! Sorry. And he also plays the carnival barker in Rocky's Hallucination, which brings a perfect kind of energy. Right up, get to <laughs> well, I'm nearly out of sleeves and ideas. Valentine Stokes' as Zib is also perfect. Not only does he have the perfect name for a mob adjacent character, but one thing that is alarmingly impressive about him is that he performs this perfect mumbling American heartthrob whilst being from the West Midlands. He's British. Why is it that English people pull off American characters so well? Andrew Lincoln did this amazingly in The Walking Dead, too. 
but Valentine is as amazing as Ziv as Andrew Lincoln is, as Rick. I would say that he brings Zib to life, but is Zib truly alive? He brings Zib to sleep perfectly, making him sound at once wise and incomprehensible with an air of world-weary skepticism and mindless buffoonery that you would hope Zib would have. You know, <laughs> he said, bent over his illicit beverage. Who who? That guy? How about you, Wick? Shall I serenade you personally? Ash Wagner as Mitzi is also the perfect fit for this role. She brings this southern belle right off the page. Somehow with just her voice you can hear more going on under the refined tone she puts on. Not only that, but she plays an amazing Nina McMurray. Even though we only hear her for a moment, she sounds just as highly strung and on edge as you'd expect, and I'm sure that she can capture her vitriol too, as we've seen in the comic dubs. You've dislocated! Both of your arms! And though scrutinized and scandalized and troubled in the end by depleted finances... Hmm. Familiar story. Miss Duncan leaves behind, moreover, a legacy of consummate artistry and bold innovation. <sighs> Used to be we could drive a whole convoy of trucks in. Now we're just digging for scraps. Bradley Gareth wasn't necessarily the voice I expected to come out of Wick, but it fits quite well. It's more accurate to the way people spoke around this era than I think I pictured, as I had him pinned with a more generic modern movie good guy voice. However, this voice fits the time period more, and though we don't hear his more intimate tones from this voice actor in this pilot, I do hope that he can pull them off. Uh. Once I've had a few more illicit beverages, perhaps. What's that aftertaste? Mm, crisp, full-bodied, um, reminiscent of oak wood. Coffin varnish! Dynamite? What dynamite? Jason Manocha as Victor is also a wonderful, wonderful choice. I seem to recall him playing Megatron at some point, and he brings a similarly surly attitude here. While we don't hear his more soft tone very often, we've just recently got a very little touch of it in this short, and he pulls it off very well. His accent is fitting, and his delivery matches the comedic and intimidating tone that we see from almost every line that Victor has in the comics. He also plays Asa Sweet in this pilot, which I think he does a good job at. It's actually a little difficult to tell that it's the same person, which is a testament to his range. Yeah, we can call it the Sunset Rose Cocktail. <laughs> No. Bedtime with ice cream scoop. No! It's malfunction. <laughs> I could teach you. How to ice cream scoop? Let me see if I have this right. Ruthless, infamous hatchet man Mordecai Heller is calling me to ask for a ride. Yes. <laughs> However, Mr. Sweet, it seems... What, what am I, your it... dad? Yeah, that's a real liability. And I can only stave off so much heat from the higher-ups before this whole city starts smoldering. Oh, those dragons. Right then. Time to tie up some loose ends. We barely hear anything from Walter Thomas Vitola in these animations, but he does capture the absolute beanage that is Horatio the Doorman. We see a little of him in the comics, too, so I hope we get some more of him. Miss M. Horatio. The door, sweetheart. Oh, right! Who plays Ivy's dad in the new Sean? Eh, it's probably some existing crew or someone I've never heard of. Now it's a pleasure to be meeting you, sweetheart. Quite a pleasure. Excuse my sudden visit, but I saw your fiasco on the picture show. Oh my god, it's Ed Bosco. How many connections am I going to find in these reviews? He brings the perfect fast-talking smart-mouth energy that Ruby needed here. Like I said, we'd never heard from him in the comics at all, but this performance makes him very watchable. I was going to say that he sounds like a used car salesman, but then in this shot I realised he is a used car salesman in essence. It's certainly a fitting energy. Once again, he sounds nothing like the other roles I've heard him in, so this is amazing that Ed pulls this off. 
Victor! Back from the hinterlands? Killer Joe? Hey, Heartstopper. Ruby Pepper. What happened to New Year's? I, I know, I know. It's Effie. She's, uh... We'll talk later. The whole cast of Cats does an amazing job, not just by their own merits, but in releasing this bottled up view that the fandom has of each of these characters and running with it. It can't be easy matching several thousand people's idea of what your cat should sound like, but everyone nailed it. I also have to give kudos to the behind the scenes staff. The Discord mods who double as 3D animators, the Raptorial animators, the Lapine cleanup crew who introduced me personally to the whole thing, and all the other members of the crew who are even more behind the scenes. It always makes me smile to see a Lacassona pointing at a credit on a post on Twitter, and just knowing the mountains of talent that went into this multi-decade long passion project. Conclusion so I literally just uploaded, uploaded, I don't know if that's the right word, posted a um, poll on my YouTube channel um, about where, like, whether I should release this video uh, in the current state or if I should uh, do some more editing or just scrap the whole thing. Uh, but interacting with this YouTube following, I guess you could call it. I'm not used to calling it that. Um, just kind of made me realize at the very end of the video here, we're talking about uh, how much uh, Lackadaisy has been part of my life. But um, one thing I kind of forgot until that moment was that my first video ever on my YouTube channel to break a hundred views was a Lackadaisy comic dub. Back before any of the voice actors had been uh, released, uh, revealed, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> just release, release Pro ZD onto the onto the field, um, like a Yu-Gi-Oh card. Now, like um, <clears throat> before any of them had been revealed, before they started doing their own comic dubs, I was doing a few comic dubs, and the first video on my channel ever to break a hundred views was a Lackadaisy dub. Uh, I stopped doing them when the uh, <laughs> when the cast was released and they started doing their own. Uh, ow, that was my finger if you'd heard that. Um, when they started doing their own um, dubs, because obviously I, I could not compare and I would had no niche in the market to fill anymore because they were doing their own stuff, the official stuff. Um, but yeah, that's another reason why this series is quite important to me, really. Um, the growth of this channel is something that I never really expected. Um, there has been videos a few years, years? Jesus, what am I talking about? Maybe a year or so ago when we started. I honestly don't know. But when I first started the has-been videos, I had no idea that it would help to grow the channel as much as it has. <laughs> to the point where I can actually post a, a community post about, you know, like with a poll on it and get like 10 votes. Like that in and of itself is mind-blowing to me. Let alone the fact that I have the amount that I have now. Like, what do I have? I am genuinely looking this up in real time because I don't actually know what I'm on currently. 977 subscribers with 85 videos and that is absolutely ridiculous to me when i when i started this channel um i mean i, I started this channel so i could subscribe to people i liked that was it <laughs> eventually it became a thing where i was like okay i, I like voice acting i'll do some audio books you know maybe do some random memery on the side uh, then it developed into, you know, this is a nice platform to show off some of my writing stuff, like the Humanity short horror story I made, or, um, you know, random music things where I just mash some songs together, terribly, I will admit. Um, <clears throat> my, my editing software is not suited for music editing. <laughs> um, like, the moment I started posting the has-been videos, and they were getting in a week what some of my Metal Gear videos were getting in a month. Um, and then the Metal Gear videos were getting in a month what my uh, audiobooks never got. I mean, my last upload of the War of the Worlds audiobook has 57 views. The has-been video before it, which was, it was posted literally a month before it, has 1.7k views, and it is literally just me saying I'm not going to cover has been anymore. So that was crazy, but like, 
before any of that was a lackadaisy dub that broke a hundred within like I, I want to say it was very early on after it was uploaded. I honestly can't remember, but it it, it, it it blew my mind at the time, and it still, to a degree, blows my mind that any video of mine has above 100 views, let alone 10k in the case of Has Been Episode 2. Like, Jesus. Um, I don't, I don't even know if that's the most viewed one of my Has Been videos. I think it is. Yeah, it's tied with episode 3 currently. Both of those are at 10. 10k. Um, but before any of this was lackadaisy blowing my mind on my YouTube channel. And as a result, it, it, it will always hold a special place for me. Besides just being part of my life, besides me having various um, bits of physical paraphernalia and following the channel and the comic for four years five years ish like besides all of that it's personally you know it's important to my work for me work is just a random job that i do on the side of this well no this is what i do on the side of that but you know what i mean like this is important to me whereas the job is important to me in other ways but this is more fulfilling like, I like my job, but this this is important to me on more of a spiritual meta level. And Lackadaisy has been a key element of that. So I should probably wrap this unscripted segment up. This is the second unscripted segment in this video where I ramble for way too long. The last one was 14 minutes. This one's five already, nearly six. So I'm going to... I'm going to go back to me from months ago to wrap this up, but just know that Lackadaisy has been an important part of both my personal life and my YouTube life for a long while. Um, and I'm also very thankful to you guys for everything that you guys have, have done for my channel in, in the last, what is it, eight months since my last Has Been video? That's what I can see on YouTube currently. Um, and I'm hoping you guys like this video too. Because, as I've said, it seems like Lackadaisy has been a key element in, in my channel flourishing. So, I'm hoping that will be a continued thing and I hope you guys like this. Anyway, back to me rambling on... Well, no, that's it's a scripted thing, so not rambling. Back to non-rambling me. Rereading parts of the comic for this review made me realise just how much nuance I missed in my first few readings. And makes me want to do full reviews of the main comic run. I may split it up into three or four videos if I do that sort of thing, as the art style seems to change several times, and I think it may be a good idea to separate a perpetual story like this in that fashion. There's no chapters, no to-be-continueds, no end, really. Just a continuous story, and I think if I were to cover it, I'd have to do it in this way. I do worry, however, that this would quickly just turn into me dubbing the whole comic myself. This franchise has been a part of my life for years now, and the details are just as important to me as the broad strokes. I would recommend that you take the time out of your life to watch the animations at least, if not the whole comic and every side comic. I would say start with the side comics, the fun little add-ons, if you feel daunted by the main comic, but I will say that it only took me three days of on and off reading to go through the whole webcomic. So it's not as daunting as getting into something like Jojo or, God forbid, One Piece or Dragon Ball. I've still not got into the latter two. I will continue to watch the progress of this wonderful little show, with close and keen attention, and I hope you do too. So what'll be next for this review series? Well, you'll just have to wait and see. Because if I'm honest, I don't even know.